Queen Gorilla beat. of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. What's good, everybody? I'm Gigi, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up with no chases. And I do mean straight up with no chases. Now, before I get things started, I want to give a shout out to all of the members of the Green Gorilla Channel, like I always do. It's a Monday morning, man. Everybody's slow to get back and what have you. And uh, let me just get through this, man. I want to give a shout out to Jay Charles, Mark Hope, Lee Ways, Jeffrey Speed, the nameless protagonist, the face, Raiz Muaji, 
Mark Swift, Show Me, Black Dog, Odd Collar, Craig, Raphael Brown, Omni Americana, Deanne, Donna Watts, Barry Little, Ryan Jackson, HipHop.CATV, Coach DC, The Remedy, Kashif Caldwell, Infamous Chillin', I Am Black Man, Nichita, True King 337, May Rest in Heaven, Force Windu, Mr. Blue Caller, Barnolas, Kyle J. Sura, I'm Just Jules, The Book of Ronin, Ab Media 83, Damon Harris, Brian McMurray, Mr. Lou Meth, TD Hip Hop Media, Drew Main, Shop Talk Live, Mr. Heat, Afro Analyst, NEU, Isa Abdul Zahir, Sir Anthony, Deshaun Nolly, MLR, Charles Rogers, Universal 178, Black Square 404, Rashid Barnes, Aaron Smith, DH, C Truth the Revelator, Gold Professor, Black Pill Ned Stark, Author Unknown, Dr. Tia San Johnson, Brian Williams, Kalon Jakala, Sherrod Martin, Ricky Dawson, Cedric Bowman, True 7360, BK Born Shahid, James Washington, Hostel Adept, Seven Coast Dojo, W Pure One, Roguish the Buildmonger, I Care, BGS Ivmore, Marvin Battle Jr., Quaku 217, S. Haywood, Dragon 59, Supreme Ivmore, Adrian Hicks, Jay Bailey, Mr. Michi, Mo Mal, William Ruffin, and Asangwa. Shout out to y'all, man. Thank you so much for being members of the Green Gorilla channel and helping me to keep things going, man. I really appreciate your help, man. Y'all deserve a round of applause. Thank y'all. Thank y'all, thank y'all. Thank you for supporting me and helping me to keep the thing going, man. Appreciate that, because you don't have to do that, man. So, love to y'all, peace to y'all. Thank you to you all. And if you're inquiring about how you can become a member of the Green Gorilla channel, well, here's how. I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. The place where black men can express themselves freely. Straight up, no chaser. Today I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now to participate in the Green Gorilla channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the join button, which is located right next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Now for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching and be careful out here people. Bless. What I want to do is have a conversation with y'all about Simone de Beauvoir. Now, we've talked about Betty Friedan. I never really went into her book and her theory, but we've talked about her. We've talked about the Combahee River Collective extensively. I've even, you know, had a discussion in a tangential way about intersectionality, whatever the case may be. But today I thought it would be useful to cover the thought of Simone de Beauvoir. Now, I don't know if you know who the woman is, but um, for the most part, you know, she is a philosopher, uh, a writer, wasn't known to be a philosopher until recently, but she's been, you know, kind of grandmothered into the discipline as somebody who's acknowledged as being a true, authentic, popular, you know, and uh, influential philosopher, you know, uh, a professional. Uh, not that she actually made money teaching philosophy, but that, you know, her impact has been profound. Now, I mean, this woman was born in 1908, and she is a member of the bourgeois class, okay? Her uh, father was a legal secretary, and her mother was a banker's daughter and a devout Catholic. She had a sister named Helene, and she was born after Simone de Beauvoir. But their family struggled 
to maintain their bourgeois status after World War I. Uh, her mother, whose name is Francois, basically wanted her kids to be sent to a convent. And Beauvoir early on had ambitions to be a nun. But during her teen years, she said, skip that. And basically, she was an atheist for the rest of her life. Now, um, Simone de Beauvoir was a very smart child. And she was precocious. I mean, her father encouraged her to be the woman that she was. Not a mother. A mother wanted to send her to a fucking convent. It was a daddy that gave her the inspiration to be an intellectual, a thinker, a philosophy, a, a, you know, a philosopher, excuse me. Um, and her father would boast, she thinks like a man. <laughs> now, uh, because of her family's circumstances, uh, Beauvoir couldn't rely on a dowry. And you know what a dowry is. A dowry is something that a family provides uh, for their child to be married. And it's, you know, like a, a package, a financial package that's given to the husband or the family of the husband. And that put her marriage prospects at risk. And she took that opportunity to actually make a living and earning for herself. Now, I mean, the woman was smart now. You, you, you can say what you want to about what her thoughts are, but she's a smart lady. Um, she passed baccalaureate exams in math and philosophy uh, in 1925. She studied mathematics at the Institut Catholique de Paris and literature languages at the Institut Saint Marie. And then she studied philosophy at the Sorbonne. And after completing her degree in 1928, she wrote her Diplôme de tout supérieur, which is basically like a master's degree, a, a master's thesis on Leibniz. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of the philosopher Leibniz. I'm not about to get into all that, okay? Um, but the name of the uh, thesis was the concept of Leibniz. Now, this woman worked with some pretty influential uh, philosophers. Uh, continental philosophers because you got philosophy on the American side and then you got philosophy on the European side. On the European side it's typically referred to as continental philosophy. Alright? Now the people that she first worked with were Merleau Ponty and Claude Levi Strauss and all three of them completed their teaching requirements uh, at the same time in secondary school, okay? She sat in on courses at some school called Ecole Normale Superior in preparation for the aggregation in philosophy, a highly competitive postgraduate exam which serves as a national ranking of students, okay? And it was while doing this, studying for this aggregation or aggregation, that she met John Paul Sartre, who is the founding father of existentialism, uh, another philosopher by, by the name of Paul Nizan and Rene Mehu. And they gave her a nickname. They called her the Beaver. <laughs> That's crazy because in America, you know, the Beaver uh, means some different shit, but you know, okay, well, it is what it is. All right, so uh, why am I telling y'all this? I'm giving you some backdrop, okay? before I get into what it is that I really got to get into, okay? Um, now, John Paul Sartre won first place in the aggregation, this exam. But Simone de Beauvoir, she came in second, okay? And at age 21, she was the youngest person to ever pass this examination. So she was a smart lady, okay? Now, here's the thing, man. This is just funny as hell to me, man. So here you got this woman. To me, I, I, I'm I'm just saying she's a privileged lady to me. Okay, uh, her family may have you know ran upon some hardships or whatever the case may be, but she's a bourgeois white woman from France. That's those are the facts to me. 
She wasn't the descendant of slaves. She never had to go through Jim Crow or no shit like that. She's a privileged white woman. And it's funny to me, though, you know, how these white women, who for the most part to me are privileged ladies, you know, they have so much to say about how women are so oppressed. When they enjoy a quality of life that most people throughout the world couldn't even imagine. But those are just my thoughts about this, you know. Um, and this is a little professorial today. I'm not going to be ranting and raving unless it touches my spirit, and then I will. But, um, you know, she's a privileged white lady, man. <laughs> That's all I can say, bro. Um, now, this woman taught at the high school level, the lycee level, uh, until she could actually support herself, and she supported herself through writing. Okay, uh, and her and John Paul Sartre, the father of existentialism, actually they became a couple. And you know, uh, her father, Simone's father, was like, "What up, dude? You, you're banging my daughter. You gonna have to marry her." <laughs> and so I said, "Okay, I'll marry you on a provisional basis." He said, "Let's sign a two-year lease." <laughs> Talk about some rare pill shit, man. That dude was like, look, uh, we going to reevaluate this shit later. <laughs> That's crazy to me, man. He, you know, saw it, man, was a playboy, man. Uh, so he did, what the, he did what he wanted to do, bro. <laughs> He's like, I... I'll fuck with you for two years and then we'll reevaluate this shit here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, they kind of work with each other and they read each other's work over the course of their lives. Uh, they, you know, considered themselves to have like a soulmate kind of relationship, you know, and it was a sexual relationship, but it wasn't an exclusive relationship. So they both was smashing and grabbing, you know, they both was thoughts. <laughs> That's just the way it is, man. That's just what they were, man. You know? Uh fucking on your bitch here, that that that. Fucking on your bitch here, that that that. <laughs> I hate to say that, man. It just it is what it is, man. Okay, so uh why is she important, man? Like, why? Because more than any other individual, she's the one that made the differentiation between sex and gender. That, uh, that's just it, bro. She's the one that came up with the idea that if you were born a female, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a woman. Because woman and womanhood is a social construct. Thank you, Mr. Heat, for your, uh, your contribution. And yes, support the Green Gorilla channel. If you like the content, and uh, you like the information that I give you. And look, the information is not always going to be titillating and scintillating. But it's information nonetheless. So if you like the information that you receive and you like how I break it down, please support the channel. But anyway, um, she's responsible for this concept of sex and gender being different. Okay? Now... I can see that to a certain extent. If you're a woman in the 1950s and you got to be married, that's the only meaning you can find in your life. That's it. No meaning beyond being married. Then I could kind of understand it to a certain degree, but I mean, shit, here's a woman who's going to school. I mean, the society couldn't have been so restrictive. I mean, the woman went to school. She was educated. A bourgeois woman. I, like sometimes I hear like statements about how oppressive Western culture is to women. And then I look at the experience of black folks, men and women. Um, and, you know, I, I just don't understand like a, a lot of what their beef is about. I just I, I'm consistently taken aback by the ideas that they put forth related to their oppression. And then they kind of universalize it. And it's all predicated upon them being able to do the same kind of shit that men do. 
or being, you know, able to have access to areas in the society that men have access to or that white men have access to. Because not everybody had access to all of the social and political rights as everybody else. So that's just worth keeping in mind. Now, what I'm about to do, and I, I, I'm not about to read uh, from the primary text of Simone de Beauvoir, but I am going to read from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which I trust that source. Okay, It's a secondary source, but it's a source that I trust. It's a source that's informative. It's a source uh, that, for the most part, I perceive as accurate in relation to, you know, a dumb braiding or outlining a philosopher's thought. All right. So I'm going to read this shit. I'm going to react to it. And I want to know what you think, because do you think that womanhood or femininity is a construct or do you think it's natural? You're saying you got no sound? I got sound. Is there any sound? Do y'all hear any sound, man? If you hear some sound, put a one. If you don't hear any sound, put a two. I got sound. Please let me know before I even move forward, man. Because I got sound. Somebody's saying there is no sound, but I have sound. He might be early on in the program. That might be what it is. If you got sound, put a one. If you got no sound, put a two. Because I don't want to move forward without having that knowing, uh, that understanding. Okay, he say I'm good. All right. So uh, he might be caught up in uh, looking at the video at a, a different time. That's probably what it is. All right. So anyway, man, let's just get into this, man. So I, I, j I just want to get right to it. So um, let's look at this. Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and explore the ideas, the main ideas behind the second sex. That's what we should do. So let's do that, bro. All right. I think y'all can see that. You should be able to see that. Yeah, you can see that. Let me uh, plus this so you can really see it. All right. So anyway, the second sex. The second sex, the woman as other. All right. Now, I'm not going to read all the introductory parts of this, but it says the second sex. Uh, it reworks and materially situates her analysis in some book she wrote called The Ethics of Ambiguity. And the paragraph goes on to say imaginary caricatures will be replaced by phenomenological descriptions of the real situations of real women. And it says where Beauvoir's earlier works blurred the borders separating philosophy and literature, her lady, uh, later writings disrupt the boundaries between the personal, the political, and the philosophical. So here you're already seeing this idea of the personal and the political being not separable, they're being inseparable, okay? Um, now, Beauvoir takes herself, her situation, her embodiment, and the situations and embodiments of other women as the subjects of her philosophical reflections. And so it's talking about other works that she did that predates the second sex. And it says where the ethics of ambiguity conjured up images of ethical and unethical figures to make its arguments tangible, the analysis of the second sex or materialized in Beauvoir's experiences as a woman and in women's, uh, women's lived realities. Where the ethics of ambiguity speaks of mystification in a general sense, the second sex speaks of specific ways that the natural and social sciences and the European literary, social, political, and religious traditions have created a world where impossible and conflicting ideals of femininity produce an ideology of women's natural inferiority to justify patriarchal domination. So you're seeing a lot right there, okay? So Europe has created 
literary, social, and political and religious traditions that make women naturally inferior to men. All right? And that justify men governing or ruling over women. Okay? Now, Beauvoir's self-criticism suggests that her later works mark a break with her earlier writings. We should, however, resist the temptation to take this notion of discontinuity too far. Rather than thinking in terms of breaks, it is more fruitful to see the second sex in terms of a more radical commitment to the phenomenological insight that it is as embodied beings that we engage the world. Now, I don't know if you know what phenomenology is. It's a particular school of philosophical thought that ultimately says that Knowledge and your understanding of the world should begin with an examination of consciousness and, and concrete experience, embodied experience. So all of this platonic shit where you contemplate the forms or the essence, the logos, the noose, what lies behind the veil of existence, some transcendental object. No, you, you don't start there. You start with what you know related to your own consciousness and experiences and related to your physical experiences, your embodied experiences. All right, so that's what phenomenology is. It's a school of philosophical thought. All right, Merleau Ponty uh, was one of the, and Husserl, I don't know if you ever heard, ever heard of those guys before, but they're like some of the founding architects of uh, phenomenology. All right. Now, let's get to the meat of this shit. It says in this Stanford Encyclopedia uh, a philosophy uh, article, this installment, that before the second sex, the sexed gendered body was not an object of phenomenological investigation. So before her, nobody talked about sex versus gender. People didn't explore this idea, but after her, it blew wide open, okay? So she changed this. Her argument for sexuality takes two directions. The first direction, it exposes the ways that masculine ideology exploits the sexual difference to create systems of inequality. So the idea of what's masculine exploits sexual difference to create systems of inequality. That's the first thing. And secondly, it identifies the ways that arguments for equality erase the sexual difference in order to establish the masculine subject as the absolute human type. Now look here, bro. I don't know if you understand what that actually means. But to some degree, I agree with this second part. Because in this culture, you got a lot of women who are behaving in a masculine fashion in order to articulate and to demonstrate or to show that they're equal to men. I just think that's, in the end, I think that's a losing proposition. That's just my viewpoint. A lot of people may not see it that way, but I see it that way. Because you cannot be other than what you are. Now, there's sexual dimorphism in the human species, man. That's just the way that it is, bro. On average, men have more muscle mass than women. <laughs> women live longer than men. I mean, there are a whole host of different ways that you can talk about stronger, weaker, a whole host of ideas that you could think related to that. OK, fitness and so on and so forth. But the reality of the situation is in terms of strength. You'd be hard pressed to find a woman. Who's stronger than a man like the shit that fucked me up, right? I was reading uh, Facebook and looking through my timeline and I saw this article and it was talking about Vanessa, uh, not Vanessa, but uh, Serena Williams being the greatest athlete in the world. She's the GOAT. Because she's won so many titles, 
grand slams and so on and so forth. But we already know, and Serena herself admitted that as it pertains to the game of tennis, if she would have played a game of tennis with a man, even somebody who's like underneath the top 100 men, she would probably lose. She would lose. So as far as I'm concerned, the very notion that women want to enter into the world of men, perform and act and do shit the way men do it, you're going to lose. So ultimately she says, okay, we can have equality without erasing sexual differences. And we don't have to establish masculinity as the absolute human type. Because, but that's the problem I find that women are having. Right now, women, are, a whole bunch of them, as far as I'm concerned, or into masculine energy to such an extent, they may as well grow some fucking nut sacks. Shit. I'm just saying, man. But okay. All right, let me let me not go there. Okay. So anyway, here she's being critical of Plato. Okay? Beginning with the premise that sex is an accidental quality. It concludes that women and men, and this is Plato. Plato basically argues this, that sex is accidental. And I agree with this as well. Like, you didn't choose prior to your birth what sex you were going to be, whether you had nuts or a uterus. You didn't decide that. That was just the luck of the draw. That was just how it came out. So Plato says, well, if that's the case, then uh, women and men are equally qualified to become members of the guardian class. Now, let me just say this, give you a little backdrop here. Plato argues that in a just society, an ideal society, a republic, there'll be three classes. You'll have wage earners who will be at the bottom of the class. You'll have guardians who are basically the soldiers. And then you'll have philosopher kings. And his argument is, well, philosophers are not really preoccupied with making money. They're orientated towards the truth. And money is okay, but I mean, you know, if your only pursuit is that of money, you don't need to be in charge because then it's going to corrupt you and you're going to mislead the populace in your own self-interest. All right. So he says that the guardian class is the next class down where you find people with noble spirits and the wage earners have the least uh, noble spirit. They're like, and then he draws a comparison between the society and an individual. So the people who are the most virtuous are those persons who have a balanced soul, just like the city state. So rationality is supposed to govern over emotions and also rationality is supposed to govern over your appetites. So that's how Plato works this, right? So basically, Plato says, well, you know, you got some women who are courageous and you got some men who, for the most part, are fucking cowards. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make sense to him to take a man that's a coward and put him in the military because he's going to just be a coward. So you want to take courageous and virtuous people, whether they're male or female, put them into a military situation and not that the women are going to fight on the front lines. Cause he, he does make the case that like, okay, women aren't as strong as men, but they can play a supporting role in the context of war. They can, this is what he says. All right. And, uh, so he says, but the, and, and here's her critique of this. She says that, the price of women's admission to this class, the guardian class, is that they must train and live like men. But I don't understand this. Like what the fuck else are they supposed to do? If you're engaged in an activity that's associated with martiality, 
you ain't gonna have no time to be fucking around with bibs and diapers and shit, man. You got to be ready to grab some swords, some bows and arrows, and fucking man the catapults. Period. Because if a man runs up on you and is about to slash you, you better be trained to some degree on how to repel that shit. So when it comes to martiality, there is no, well, you know, I want to behave like a woman in this space. What the fuck does that even mean? It makes no sense to me, but that's just my feelings. Those are my thoughts, okay? She says, thus, and this is a paraphrasing of her. This is secondary literature. The discriminatory sexual difference remains in play. Only men or those who emulate them may rule. Beauvoir's argument for equality does not fall into this trap. She insists that women and men treat each other as equals and that such treatment requires that their sexual differences be validated. Equality is not a synonym for sameness. Now, I agree with this to a certain extent. I'm just going to keep it 100. I do to a certain extent. Treating men and women equally does not require men and women to be, be treated exactly the same. But same or treated equally or differently related to what, though? If it's war, you got to be treated related to your ability to kill the enemy, period. What you going to kill them with? Twerking? <laughs> that shit is fucking crazy to me, bro. <laughs> How you going to kill the motherfucker? Twerking? <laughs> you saw this shit recently. Like, you know, you had a bunch of women that got naked in front of the police doing Black Lives Matter. Like, that, that's nonsensical to me. What is the standard for martiality? It's war and your ability to kill the enemy or to control the environment while you're engaged in war. Anyway, the second sex argues against the either or frame of the woman question, either women and men are equal or they are different. It argues for women's equality while insisting on the reality of the sexual difference. Beauvoir finds it unjust and immoral to use the sexual difference as an argument for women's subordination. Now, there are a lot of men in this space that feel that women should be subordinate. They are beneath you. Do as I say. I tell you to jump you ask how high. There are a lot of men who believe this. Now, I, look, I've never required a woman to do exactly what I say. Some of what I say and what I have to impart in terms of wisdom and knowledge, I expect to be absorbed and taken into consideration when decisions are being made. I'm going to take her understanding and her wisdom and her knowledge or whatever the case may be into consideration before I make a decision. If I have a woman, I'm not just going to make whatever decision I want, like fuck you in your opinion, your feelings, everything. I wouldn't do that. But you got to ask the question, <clears throat> is this something that's only unidirectional? You act like, I mean, this woman acts like women don't make demands upon men and make requirements upon men and dictate and necessitate certain shit from men. I just don't understand this, man. Like, and here's, the, here's another thing that I, I got to say about this. Just to begin with, phenomenology is about firsthand experience, subjective experience. Then you take your subjective experience and you extrapolate from that and you make determinations about the world at large. Now, the problem I have with this is, OK, you can record and register the thoughts and the opinions of women. But where is the counterbalance to that? Because the world is just not filled with women. Who feel like they got a shitty deal. It's also filled with men who feel like they got shitty deals. But nobody wants to have a candid conversation about that. All we're doing 
is recording and absorbing and commiserating and empathizing with the quality of life and the thoughts and the emotions and the fee-fees of women. So I think that things are out of whack. That's just my opinion. Anyway, she says, right, or goes on to say, she finds it unphenomenological to ignore the sexual difference. As a phenomenologist, she is obliged to examine women's unique experiences of their bodies and to determine how these experiences are co-determined by what phenomenology calls the everyday attitude, common sense assumptions that you don't think about, okay? As a feminist, phenomenologist assessing the meanings of the lived female body, Beauvoir explores the ways that cultural assumptions frame women's experiences of their bodies and alienate them from their body's possibilities. What, for example, it is assumed that women are the weaker sex. Well, body strength, but then it goes on to say what I said earlier. What she directs us to ask is the ground of this assumption. What criteria of strength is it you, is going to be used? Is it upper body power, body size? Is there a reason not to consider longevity or life, you know, longevity of life a strength? So using this criterion, would women still be considered the weaker sex? Now, one could argue, you know, men do die earlier than women. Now, the question is, why do men die earlier than women? Could it be stress and the constraints of society and the rigors and the strictures that it puts us through that creates these kind of stresses for us? Or is it something different or is it just natural? See, when you start talking about nature versus nurture, where does nature end, where does nurture begin and vice versa? It's very difficult to untangle that, to unpack that. But I digress. Anyway, it says, using this criterion, will women still be considered the weaker sex? A bit of reflection exposes the biases of the criteria used to support the supposedly obvious fact of women's weakness and transforms it from an unassailable reality to an unreliable assumption. Once we begin this questioning, it is not long before other so-called facts fall to the side of common sense in the phenomenological sense. Anyway, what is most perhaps the most famous line of the second sex is on ne pas film, on les divions. Translation, one is not born, but becomes a woman. One is not born a woman, but becomes a woman. So she's going to argue that womanhood in and of itself is a social construction. That being a female is a natural condition but being a woman is something that's social it's a construction okay so she's credited by many as alerting us to the sex gender distinction now whether or not Beauvoir understood herself to be inaugurating this distinction whether or not she followed this distinction to its logical or radical conclusions or whether or not radical conclusions are justified are currently matters of feminist debate what is not a matter of dispute is that the second sex gave us the vocabulary for analyzing the social constructions of femininity and a method for critiquing these constructions. By not accepting uh, the common sense idea that to be born with female genitalia is to be born a woman, this most famous line of the second sex pursues the first rule of phenomenology. Identify your assumptions, treat them as prejudices, and put them to the side. Do not bring them back into play until and unless they have been validated by experience. So then the question becomes, and let me just unpack this a little bit more, man. Uh, ultimately, she's basically saying, look, if you got female genitalia, it doesn't mean you're a woman. And like, you know, a lot of people, you know, in this culture are scratching their heads like, what, what do you mean by this? Because people are switching gears. It's one thing to say, look, 
I'm a man and I'm in touch with my feminine side or some shit like that, or a woman to say I'm in touch with my masculine side, because there's masculine and feminine energy if you want to characterize it in popular cultural concepts, right? There's there's those things in everybody. But then to say, okay, well, I'm not a woman on account that I'm aggressive, I'm, you know, argumentative and I'm assertive or whatever the case may be, it, or rude, just like men are to some extent, a lot of men are, that I'm not a woman, it's puzzling to me. Because in this culture, we don't make hard and fast distinctions between sex and womanhood or sex and manhood. We just don't do that. Anyway, take it within the context of his contemporary philosophical sense, the second sex was a phenomenological analysis waiting to happen. Whether or not it required a woman phenomenologist to discover the effects of sex gender on the lived body's experience cannot be said. That it was a woman who taught us to bracket the assumption that the lived body's sex gender was accidental to its lived relations, positions, engagements is a matter of history. What is a phenomenological breakthrough became in the second sex a liberatory tool. So these are feminists writing this, okay? By attending to the ways the patriarchal structures use the sexual difference to deprive women of their can-do bodies. Like, can do what, though? <laughs> I, I had a conversation with, like, a feminist not too long ago about this. And this is what kind of prompted me to... to Put this out here for y'all. Because men find themselves right now in like a catch-22 situation. Because I, perfect, to be perfectly honest, if women are putting forth the idea that just because they're females, they're not women, then how are men supposed to treat them? Because you don't want to be treated like other men because elsewhere in the culture and in the society in which we live, you demand, expect, that you be treated like women. So on the one hand, they don't want to be treated like women, but they do want to be treated like women. So men are left scratching their heads like, what the fuck are you talking about? And this is what's so puzzling. And I've said this before many times on this show. Women want the rights and the privileges of men and they want to maintain the privileges of women while taking on the responsibility fully of neither role. How in the fuck is that possible? This is why you see a lot of aggressive, crazy ass behavior on the part of women. And then all of a sudden they'll pull right back away from that and act like, for example, they're being abused or some other shit like that. So you'll have women in the household being aggressive, nasty, mean, masculine, and then it, it, and they'll smack your ass. But if you smack one of them, they're going to say, oh, you abuse me. So men are left thinking to themselves, like, what, what the fuck are y'all trying to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to be a man or a woman? Do you want to compete only with women or do you want to compete in the world of men? And if you want to compete in the world of men with other men, then why should men bracket off their, 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 their whatever their fucking ideals, their attitude, their comportment to just fit in with you and to make sure that you feel good? Why? You say you got this, sis. You got this. So let's say, for example, women say, okay, well, we can compete with men. We're the greatest of all in sports. No, no, you're not. Not until you compete with men. Let's say, fuck it. Take off the gloves. No pulling punches. You want to consider yourself to be the greatest MMA fighter? Then you got to fight the, the dopest, strongest, most adroit, and most skillful men. No, it sounds fucked up. But if that's what you want, that's what you have to commit yourself to. You can't oscillate like a fan going back and forth 
from one idea or one area of comportment to the next. You can't be the boss and then say, well, I want a man to be the boss. Either you motherfucker the boss or you're not the boss. You can't go from being independent from wanting a high value man to take care of you. You can't have it both ways. But here you have a situation in which women have begun to move into this phase of this idea that they ought to be treated like men equally. But at the same time, they still want to maintain the privileges associated with patriarchy. This is fucked up. This, at some point, this has to reach its logical conclusions in our culture. It can't persist this way. And it's good that she says, okay, you don't have to treat each other the same. We can be treated differently, but if you, in order to be treated equally, but how do you do that? Right now, you got a bunch of women entering into male spaces and declaring their right to be in those spaces. Okay, so now I'm supposed to pull my punches in order to act with you, to compete with you in those spaces that have traditionally been carved out for men. So if you say, fuck it, I want to play football with y'all. I want to play, play with y'all. So what am I supposed to do? Your ass catch the football, you about to cross the, the damn the goal line. What am I supposed to do? Not hit you? Let you get the touchdown to make you feel equal? It's just a question. Because it's confusing. Anyway, before I made the case for declaring this deprivation oppressive, taken within the context of the feminist movement, this declaration of oppression was an event. It opened the way for the consciousness raising to characterize second wave feminism. So I'm telling you this because I'm letting you know that Simone de Beauvoir opened up the potentiality, the possibility for second wave feminism. All right. What from an existential phenomenological perspective was a detailed analysis of the lived body was an ethical and political indictment of the ways the patriarchy alienated women from their embodied capacities was from a feminist perspective an appeal that called on women to take up the politics of liberation. Now, in what ways is what I'm trying to figure out that men traditionally prevented women from being able to do things with their bodies? Like what? I just don't understand it. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out because I, I don't get it. All right. I've heard one woman say that we should get rid of men and women's sports. Like, just get rid of it and just have one, one set of sports. Okay. Well, what if women aren't able to make the fucking team? Because they don't have the ability or the capacity to com meet with, uh, compete with the men. How many women do you think are going to be able to compete in the National Football League in any capacity whatsoever compared to men? I'll wait for the answer to that. Anyway, man, I want to know if y'all still here. I can't see you. Um, I'm just trying to make sure y'all still there. So men are confused. We don't know what to think or how to act or react. So let me get rid of that. If I don't go back to that. Get rid of this. So anyway, uh, it says several concepts are crucial to the argument of the second sex. The concept of the other is introduced early in the text and drives the entire analysis. It has also become a critical concept in theories that analyze the oppressions of the colonized, enslaved, and other exploited people. Beauvoir will use it again in her last major work, The Coming of Age, to structure her critique of the ways the elderly are othered in society. All right. But anyway, she bases this idea on Hegel's other in, related to the, or in relation to the master-slave dialectic in the phenomenology of spirit. All right. Um, I don't know if you know what the master slave dialectic is from Hegel, but ultimately it's the idea that masters exploit slaves 
and slaves on account of being made to do all the work come to have knowledge that the masters don't have. And therefore the masters become dependent upon the slaves to be able to actually carry out certain functions. So it's like a, it's an undermining relationship where the master slave dialectic eventually dissolves because there's, you know, this natural tendency for it to create dependency on behalf of the masters, which won't leave them in a position to be masters any longer. All right, so that's the master-slave dialectic from Hayden. All right, but instead of the terms master and slave, she uses the term subject and other. The subject is the absolute, the other is the inessential. Unlike Hegel, who universalized this dialectic, Beauvoir distinguishes the dialectic of exploitation between historically constituted subjects and others from the exploitation that ensues when the subject is man and the other is women. In the first case, those marked as other experience their oppression as a communal reality. They see themselves as part of an oppressed group. Here, oppressed others may call on the resources of a common history and a shared abusive situation to assert their subjectivity and demand recognition and reciprocity. Now, this is something that just kills me here, man. Like, this is specific to Western culture, it seems like to me, but then it tries to move beyond it. Like, in every culture, everywhere, women are just devalued and otherized just for the sake of being women. Or do you find that patriarchy in and of itself lionizes women, puts them on a fucking pedestal? Men will go over and around the world to do shit to serve women and to make sure that their needs are met and to make sure that they're happy. We call this shit simping. It's a lot of men that do this, man. They do whatever they can to make their wives happy, bruh. They don't argue with their wives. They don't get into conflict with their wives. They just say, yes, dear, happy wife, happy life. The wife tells them to go do some shit. Can you pick this up for me? Sure, babe, I'll go get it. Can you bring that for me? Sure, babe, I'll go get it. These are the lived experiences of men that are never taken into account. All we get is their account of how they feel like they're fucked over and not recognized. I just think it's one-sided. Not to mention, you know, the ways in which women will tell you, you know, I can't open this. Can you reach that for me? Can you change my tire? I need help. They play that, you know, the damsel in distress, but they don't want to be treated like the damsel in distress. They want to be independent and assertive and strong. But as soon as they feel like they don't feel like doing some shit, they call on you as a utility to extract your labor and to get the shit done. But we don't want to have an honest, open, candid conversation about that. Anyway, the situation of women is comparable to the condition of the Hegelian other and that men, like the Hegelian master, identify themselves as the subject, the absolute human type, and measuring women by the standard of human identify them as inferior. Well, don't women do this? Isn't this what women are doing now? You're not like us. You need to be more like us. Your masculinity is toxic. You need to talk like us, feel like us, empathize like us. Your lived reality is different than ours. Your experience is different than ours. So how can we compare or judge or assess who you are on our terms other than by our lived experiences. This is where phenomenology becomes absurd to me. Because all I have is my standpoint. All I know is my life and my experiences. All you know is your life and your experiences. But the funny thing is, at the current moment, this woman and other women 
like to talk about their experiences and how fucked up and difficult shit is. But primarily, they appeal to men to commiserate with them and to promote their fucking projects. For example, feminism in and of itself is a project predicated upon women whining about not being treated equally and then men saying, okay, here you go. You can have some set-asides, boo-boo. If something goes wrong, just call on me. I'll come there. I'll be there to get you out of a jam. I'll be there to save you. I just, you know, just look at the Gorilla Glue shit. If a man would have done some shit like that to his head, you'd think some fucking plastic surgeon, this a woman somewhere, would be like, oh, baby, you just made a mistake. We're going to take care of you. Fuck no. They're going to be like, you're a stupid ass nigga. You shouldn't have done that. There was a woman recently who got put in jail because she left her kids at home while she went to work. Now, I think that's a fucked up situation. That's a hard situation to be in. Because, you know, welfare is now, you know, turned into workfare and you women are required to go to work if they want to receive aid after a certain period of time, all right? So if you don't go there, then everything you got can be, you know, it can be fucked off, okay? Now, there was a guy that gave her 10 Gs. Like, I felt sorry for her. I, I, you know, well, how many dudes is gonna get that? How many guys are gonna come out and say, hey, bruh, you know, I know life is fucked up, it's hard for you. Here's 10 Gs, bruh. You shouldn't have to go through that because you couldn't pay your child support. <laughs> Man, ain't nobody coming to save you for that. Nobody. Not even people who commiserate with the problems associated with the hardships and the injustices that men suffer from. They won't even help each other with their projects and if they fall into fucked up situations. So yeah, it's just it, it just kills me. So anyway, uh, before I digress too far, then it says, unlike the other Hegelian, uh, oh excuse me, unlike the Hegelian other, however, women are unable to identify the origin of their otherness. Like men are just casting women to the side. You're not like me. You're a lesser being than me. Like, where is this experienced? By women. Because they're not treated like men. They, they're not regard Men don't even regard each other as equal. <laughs> I'm pretty sure women don't do it either. All women are the same in all women's eyes. Is that what y'all saying? Because that can't be true. Not as much petty shit as I see y'all doing. It can't, it can't be true that y'all see each other all as the same. Anyway, man, um, they don't understand how they became otherized. They cannot call on the bond of a shared history to reestablish their lost status as subjects. So... It, they lost status as subjects by giving in to what men, I guess, did to dominate them. I just find this to be a very pessimistic and a one-sided, solipsistic account of the differentiation and the different roles and the division of labor between men and women. I, I just do. But that's just my thinking. Anyway, further, the dispersed among the world of men, excuse me, further, dispersed among the world of men, they identify themselves in terms of the differences of their oppressors as white or black women, as working or middle class women, as Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddha, uh, Buddhist or Hindu women, rather than with each other. They identify themselves in terms of the differences of their oppressors. White or black women, working class or middle class women. See, see, this is what I don't like either. This takes all women 
no matter where they are, what class they're in, what kind of money they have, what kind of education they have, what kind of race they are, and it puts all women into the same boat. And then it takes all men, no matter how much money they have, no matter how educated they are, no matter what race they are, no matter what history they have, and it basically relegates them to being oppressors. I find this highly problematic. I don't know whether to blame this on the authors or to blame this on, you know, Simone de Beauvoir. But the whole point is, how is this possible? How, how is this an accurate assessment of the lived experiences of billions of women and men. So you mean to tell me that a privileged white lady from France who went to school with John Paul Sartre had Merlu Ponty as a teacher is oppressed, whereas a black man in America is, is fucking a dominator? I, I just... I don't understand this, bro. I, I just don't get this. But this is done routinely. The subtleties of people's experiences are left out, predicated upon her own bourgeois experience. And she's able to do this because she's privileged enough to take philosophy uh, courses at the fucking university level. Most women in the world aren't able to do that. But I digress. Anyway, they lack the solidarity and resources of the Hegelian other for organizing themselves into a we that demands recognition. And this is another thing that I have a problem with. When people talk about being recognized, and this is a problem I think that has something to do with feminist philosophy in general. They want to deal with the idea of this being visible, being honored, being respected, you know, like being recognized, being seen. Look, I have a right not to mistreat you. I do. I have a right to acknowledge that you are a human being and not to treat you like I would treat a dog or a cat or an ant or any other, you know, like a uh, non-living material object. I have a right to treat you like a person. But I don't have, a, a, you have the right for me to treat you like a person, right? But I don't have a duty to honor you, to recognize you. I don't have a duty to value you. I don't, I don't have a duty to be your friend, to call you valuable, to look at you as the twinkle, the apple of my fucking eye. I don't have a duty to do that with anybody other than the people I choose to do that with. I don't have the duty to make sure that everybody that I go to school with, that I'm in a fraternity with, or any other group of people that I'm associated with, I don't have a duty to make sure everybody is honored and recognized. It's impossible to do. How can I acknowledge and recognize everybody as being equal and equally valuable? Because everybody's not. And that's just a matter of, that's a matter of fact of life, man. I can't, I can't honor everybody. I don't have enough time in the day to take out and to make sure everybody gets a fucking gold star. I just don't have the time for that. And I think this is a big problem because it's all about recognition. Being honored, being seen. They say they don't want to be put on a pedestal, but shit, I can't tell. I can't tell. Anyway, going on, and it, I ain't going to take too much longer. I'm just going to get through this little section and I'm going to be done with it. Damn, it's a long section, but I'm not going to go through all of it because it's getting to the time where I'm about to put this down. But anyway, she says... In contesting their status as inessential, and this is a, who said women were inessential? Who's saying this? 
I've never, I've never heard a, a man in my life say women are inessential. I've heard men say, I ain't fucking with these bitches. <laughs> I don't feel like dealing with the headache associated with the shit. But I've never heard a man say that women are inessential. I've never heard that. They're not needed or necessary. I've heard men say, if that's how they're going to act, I'm not fucking with them. You need women for reproduction, for one, but not just relegated to that. A lot of men want women for friendship. They want bonding and partnership from women. That's what they want. Anyway, uh, in contesting their, their status is inessential, but inessential to what? That's inessential to what? Women must discover the we and take account of the mid sign. So look, mid sign is being with. That's what the shit means. Account of the, the mid sign, being with. Beauvoir uses the category of the inessential other to designate the unique situation of women as the ambiguous other of men. Unlike the other of the master slave dialectic, women are not positioned to rebel. As inessential others, women's route to subjectivity and recognition cannot follow the Hegelian script. So women can't rebel like slaves could. There's no, you know, women can't perform the same kind of radical insurrection that slaves could. This attention to what Beauvoir, borrowing from Heidegger, calls a primordial mid-sign may be why she does not repeat her earlier argument that violence is sometimes necessary for the pursuit of justice in the second sex. Often criticized as one mark of Beauvoir's heterosexism, this reference to the mid-sign is not made in ignorance of lesbian sexuality and is not a rejection of non-heterosexual sexualities. It is a recognition of the present state affairs where the heterosexual norm prevails. If patriarchy is to be dismantled, we will have to understand how heteronormative uh, sexuality serves it. We will have to denaturalize it. <laughs> how can you denaturalize something that's fucking natural, man? That creates birth and life itself. How do you do that? Creating some artificial wombs. <laughs> the birth control pill. Abortion. That's how you do it. Right? To the Beauvoir's way of thinking, however, the institutional alienations of heterosexuality ought not to be confused with the erotics of heterosexual desire. The realities of this desire and the bond of the primordial mid-sign that it forges must be taken into account. Not only is it used to enforce women's isolation, and to support their inability to identify a common history, it is also responsible for the value and relationship that Beauvoir calls the bond. A situation-specific articulation of the appeal found in the ethics of ambiguity. Now, I don't know what that is myself, so I'm going to have to read on to, to gather the context. A brief but packed sentence that appears early in the second sex alerts us to the ways that Beauvoir used existential and Marxist categories to analyze the unique complexities of women's situation. It reads, Hence, woman makes no claim for herself as subject because she lacks the concrete means. Really? Because she senses the necessary link connecting her to man without positing its reciprocity. And because she often derives satisfaction from her role as the other. So in other words, women have become accustomed to their own oppression. By being connected with men. Men can be alone without women, but women can't be alone without men. This statement needs to be read in the context of Beauvoir's ethical political question. How can a human being in a woman's situation attain fulfillment? Twerking? <laughs> uh, 
Anyway, man, between the statement and the question, we discovered the ethical political issue of fulfillment does not concern a woman's happiness. Happiness may be chosen or accepted in exchange for the deprivations of freedom. Man, look, I didn't had enough of this shit, bro. I, look. Let me let me move back, man. To the, uh, let me go to the main thing. Man. So look, it's a lot to unpack there, and I just gave you a uh, you know a, a, a foreshadowing of it. A lot of shit that women want and desire, and uh, I think this is just exaggeration. A lot of this. Especially coming from a bourgeois woman, white woman in France who made money writing books. I'm just keeping it real, man. Like, I, you know, this shit is. I just get confused by it. I don't understand it. I, I would love for women to come and to give me some understanding. It's the very society that men have built that made women being able to have these kind of arguments possible. Now, we did it together, though. I'm not going to say that men did everything and women did nothing. But then the question becomes, why is it that women want to be acknowledged and respected in, in, in the same way as men? Men don't respect other men in the same way that they respect women. They don't. Not for the same reasons. It's all contingent upon who that person is. Real talk. Like, I don't have a problem being cool with a, a lesbian woman. If she cool as fuck, she cool. I'm not going to knock the woman and say, you're an aberration. I don't like bitches like you. I don't fuck with people like you. If you cool, you cool. If we got an understanding, we good, we good. But if you try to lay a guilt trip on me incessantly, if you're constantly trying to berate me and talk about how toxic I am, I'm going to have a problem with that. And if you try to act like a dude, like, man, do you know there are women, man, who run up on men and try to test whether or not they actually going to take and put up with that bullshit? Has it ever happened to you where a woman will run up on your ass and get physical with you? The way I see it, like, I, I'm just asking, like, how do y'all want it? One of the problems is with this is women talk about their own vulnerability so much that they fail to acknowledge that there are vulnerabilities associated with being men. But then they try to do so and say, well, we need to be re-educated to be more like women. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, why do I have to need to, why do I have to become more like a woman? I ain't gonna even lie, man. Like, you know, it... women sexually assault men and boys. You you can watch Dr. T. Asan Johnson's show and you'll see a whole bunch of that. You see a whole lot of it. Women do pernicious shit. <laughs> just like men. I just don't get this shit. But the problem is. See, this is the thing. Women are acting as if they're not recognized, but they only be they only want to be recognized for good shit. That's a problem I have. You can't have it both ways. If you're going to be recognized, you got to be recognized for your good and your bad qualities. It can't be, oh, just recognize all the good shit I do and all the light and the love I bring to the world, and then let's forget about all the fucked up shit. Let's forget about manipulation, exploitation, 
Let's for, forget about the way that, you know, you use men as proxies for violence. That you, you know, basically want men to do shit for you. Some women have men wrapped around their fingers, bro. And they know this shit. Women say they want to be treated equally. Women don't want... Man, Serena don't want to play tennis with the, with the motherfucking top man in the world. She don't want to do that, bro. She didn't know she'll get her ass handed to her, bro. These women do not want trans men, or well, excuse me, transgender women to compete with them for real, bro. They don't want that, man. <laughs> I guarantee you most women don't want that. Because, look, let me tell you something. Let me tell you how this could happen. I'm six foot three. I'm not no balling ass dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can't hoop for real. Like, I mean, I can get rebounds and foul the shit out of motherfuckers and pass the ball to the guard. I can play like Rodney. That's what I can play like. I can't play like Jordan. I can play like Rodney. I can get all rebounds and give them to the point guard or the forward to push the, push the rock down the court. But if I start playing with women, I'm going to dominate the court. At damn near 50 years old. If I play full, full strength. I just look at it like this, man. I think she's right in the sense that women and men are different. Women should not be trying to act like men in order to be given the same recognition but i think that that's the problem because you got women confronting men with aggression and with assertiveness and we're trying to be masculine and men are looking at this like that's not what we want from you that's not what's going to make me respect you men don't want that from most women this is not what we want from you Now, men don't even, in the black community, men are conditioned to fuck with women with attitudes and bossy and aggressive. We've been, we've been enculturated into that. But who wants to be around a partner, even a dude? Who wants to be around a dude, man, constantly telling them what to do? Constantly creating problems. Constantly getting into confrontations. Who wants to be around a dude like that, man? Constantly fucking, you know, walking, storming off. Constantly trying to use, you know, passive aggressive behavior in order to get their way. Who wants that, man? I don't know, man. Y'all got any questions for me, man? I'll answer them. If not, I'll be up out of here, man. You know, I, look, all I'm trying to do is give you some information on how all of this began. in layman's terms even though we read through some text hopefully i was able to decipher it and break it down in such a way that you can begin to understand it in some respects but the biggest problem i have is women wanting to be acknowledged and recognized in the domain of men in the same way that men will acknowledge and respect other men I'm not going to respect Serena as a man. I'm going to respect her as a female athlete, but not as a man. Because she's not a man. And I'm not going to otherize her and be like, you're an alien. You, you know, like you're just naturally subordinate. But damn, what you do and the things that you can bring to a table related to me are going to be different than me to you. I don't want a woman, you know, to step in front of the bullet for me. I don't want a woman to be able to come change my tires, bro. <laughs> I don't want a woman to come in and show me, you know, how, how, you know, how smart she is. I don't like dudes doing that. I 
I don't want to have to be in a constant state of competition with women. See, back in the day, man, women had their own world. Men had their own world. And I always, there have always been people who cross boundaries. And we know this. Okay? There's, there are whiny, bitchy kind of men. And there's aggressive and, and masculine kind of women. This has always been the case, bro. But those are not the norm. And they want to destroy the norm in order to match reality up to the ideal about what's fair. But the oddest shit about it all is when the shit hits the fan and men actually begin to treat women how they're acting to be called upon, the first thing that they do is they resort to actually crying about how they've been mistreated as women. Explain it, bruh. That's the shit that's got me all fucked up and discombobulated, bruh. That's the shit I don't understand. It fucking kills me, bro. You can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't get the respect of men by trying to out men men. You're not going to do it, man. It's a losing proposition. But then she goes on to talk about how in other species, you know, female and male members of those species don't necessarily operate and comport and, you know, exhibit the same kind of relationships as we do, the human species. And my response to that is, that's, those are those species. It's not this one. It's not this one. It's not this species. <laughs> it's not. And I say, if you want to destroy woman, if you want to destroy manhood because you think it's toxic, you got to destroy womanhood too. You got to put that, fuck womanhood. It's got to be destroyed. If you're going to destroy masculinity, we got to destroy femininity as well. We got to destroy womanhood and all of the privileges associated with the shit as well as what's bad about it. What y'all want to do? You can't have it both ways. You can't show your ass and try to get some freebies, get some free drinks at the club, and then be like, I'm independent, and I, I can do it all on my own, except for when I decide not to and use these motherfuckers. No. No. <laughs> it's No. But you know the biggest impediment to all of this, men do not know how to switch gears. Men don't know how to switch gears, and women don't either. Because the same women who argue that they want like, you know, equality and, you know, super, you know, like uh nice guys and all this kind of shit and super uh, you know, egalitarian men, they don't like them motherfuckers. They're not even attracted to them guys if they like men to begin with. Those are not the guys that they're attracted to. <laughs> That's the craziest shit. I'll do it, man, I'm gonna read a paper on that. The proclivities of women, especially those who advocate for or push forward the notion of feminism and women's rights and equality. They're not even attracted to men who promote those, those ideals. They don't even like them. They don't even fuck with you like that. Not the long way, especially not the erotic way. But it's men that's going to be the biggest impediment. 
Because as soon as you say something about a woman, it's going to be some man somewhere that's going to come up to the defense. He's going to imagine himself to be a contemporary incarnation of Sir Galahad, Sir Lancelot, some other fucking noble knight at a round table. And he's going to put his cape on like E-40 said, and he's going to go save somebody. He's going to save one of them. And women ain't turning that down. You think the Gorilla Glue girl was like, nah, I got this. I'm independent. I'm strong. I'm going to take care of this shit myself. I fucked up. I did. A, I, I made a boo-boo. I'm going to handle it. Or you think she got her ass on that plane and milked everybody's sympathy for women? Hmm? Women know full well how they weaponize femininity and womanhood. They know full well how they do that. They know damn well how they do it. So I say this. Look, men, we have skills. We have capacities. We have qualities. They're all over the place. Not, no two men are the same. We're all different. And I agree that we shouldn't, like, be pushing for sameness. But that's all we seem to be doing in this culture. And I'm just tired of it. It's leading to the point where now you can't even check women at all for shit. You can't tell them nothing without being called a misogynist, which to me is an act in bad faith. You talk about existentialism. That's bad faith existentialism. That's bad faith. Anyway, if you got any questions, man, I'll try to answer those questions. If not, I'm about to sign off, man. I've been on here for how long? I can't even tell. Uh, yeah, an hour and 34 minutes. And I know it was a little terse. Uh, you know, I wasn't talking about welfare or, you know, thugs or nothing like that. Uh, but... <laughs> Hey, man, it's important. It's an important conversation nonetheless, I think. So if you ain't got no questions for me, I'm about to giddy up on out of here and uh, get to some food because I'm hungry as a dog. Damn. I ain't ate shit all day but a bowl of cereal. So I got to eat, bro. So if you got any questions for me, I will answer them. If not, I'm signing out. And look, this ain't an attack on women. But it's just like, damn, what the fuck do you want us to do? You got men confused. This is one of the most confusing times to live. What is your take on Alpha Sigma? I don't know who Alpha Sigma is. If you gave me some more information about who Alpha Sigma was, then I probably would be able to give you, uh, you know, some sort of answer to that but i don't i don't know who alpha sigma is i just i don't know who he is so i can't i can't give you uh i can't i can't tell you but i just think women have become more masculine and they're requiring that men respond they're requiring that men respond to their assertiveness by backing down. And because, it, but if a man back, backs in, well, steps into you, you're going to step into him. So they're requiring that men act and behave with a level of tolerance with a level of restraint associated with them. They expect that. Because if you all of a sudden act like a man with them, the first thing they're going to do is say they've been abused. Oh, yeah, I do believe that, okay, so I, I, I do believe that there are different levels of masculinity. I do believe that. 
I believe that some men are more, you know, I won't say, I won't necessarily say they're more masculine, but I, I think that some men are more, you know, rude, uh, martial. Some men are more assertive. Some men are more aggressive. I mean, and those are qualities and characteristics typically associated with being masculine. But there are some women who are just that same way. Stubborn, aggressive, violent. This is why, you know, look, we would have to determine what is it, ology, that makes women a specific kind of way and men a, spe a specific kind of way. And find out like how how far the rabbit down the rabbit hole we want to go with that, but a lot of these at least she at least I'll give uh, Simone de Beauvoir credit for touching upon the subject of biology, at least for treating it, even if she does so in passing. Because these women nowadays in these these colleges and these universities they don't talk about biology at all. And we have a more, uh, you know, a sophisticated understanding of human anatomy and, you know, the endocrine system, the nervous system, uh, you know, the respiratory, the circulatory system, the digestive. We have more knowledge about these systems in the human body than we've ever had before. They, right now, you can get an MR, in, in an MRI, they can slice your body. In, 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 you know, in images and find out if there are any blockages or there any problems anywhere within any of your systems of your body. They can literally dissect you without dissecting you through imaging. This is something they were never able to do in the past. So we know more now than we've ever known. And we know more about perhaps maybe how the, the endocrine system creates hormones and how hormones lead to different kinds of comportment. Now, if it was the case, their hormones had no impact on behavior whatsoever, then why are these fucking trans people trying to get hormone replacement therapy? Why? If you could just announce, I'm a woman, without the hormones and shit, and just go out there and just become a woman, why not do it? If, if, if you're theoretically saying that you can be that way, well, be that way then. Why you need the hormones then? Why do you need the hormones? And look, I, I'm a more cooperative individual. You know, when you when you start talking about alphas and all this kind of shit and, you know, betas and sigma males and shit like that, look, I don't have to be the top dog. I don't, I, like, I'm not striving to be that dude. I just want to be able to kick it with my dudes. Like, I mean, there will be times when I take the lead and times when they take the lead. I want to be able to exist in a situation like if we, we hunting or something like that, I listen to them sometimes, but I'm not going to listen to no dude all the time. I gotta, I'm got i going to venture off on my own. Like if I go to a club or some shit like that, I'm, I'm not the type of dude, man, that's going to stand around with my partners the entire night. No. I'm going to go off and do some shit and try to figure out worlds of my own while I'm there. I'm not going to wait for some other dude. Let's dip here. Let's dip. Oh, you don't want to dip here? Fuck it. Then I'll let you later, dog. I'm going to this spot. Yeah, well, I got two kids. Uh, damn, that's a long cowboy monk, 79. Lion is known as the alpha. The tiger is the sigma. I consider myself a sigma male because I don't have any kids. Well, I fucked up. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I guess it was, you know, uh, what, what, the, what the song say? Juicy got them crazy. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, man, and look, I'm going to just be honest, man. Like, you know, I never imp- intended to be, uh, you know, a single man at this point in my life. I, I didn't intend for that because I was sold to dream like everybody else is. You get married, you have a family, you build, you make sure the kids go to school and you leave them wealth. That's just, it, it don't happen like that no more. That shit is gone. For some people, it may exist. But my whole problem with that whole arrangement is, man, anytime a woman decides, man, she breaking bad with you, bro, she can take half your shit, the kids, the house, the car, the kids, and the dog. I want it all. And she's out. And you got to figure it out. And this shit is happening to men daily. And it ain't just so-called beta men. It's happening having to the most alpha of guys out here. Having a Jordan, Tiger. Having a whole bunch of guys. But you know, hey, it is what it is. Yeah, I can I can eat like a horse my damn self, man, and not gain a pound. So anyway, man, look, I'm almost two hours into this. All I wanted to do is just have a conversation about it. Uh, I'm not claiming that I know everything about this here. I just wanted to alert you to the fact that she's one of the people who first came up with this idea that other people carry to, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, areas and arenas, uh, the difference between gender and sex. And, you know, like to some degree, I agree there are some masculine women out here, man. And some of them bad as hell. That means look good, look like women, but they're aggressive as a motherfucker. And I don't even think black men have a problem with women being aggressive as long as they are not aggressive towards them. Or women being assertive as long as they're agreeable. Even a man who's an alpha male, he's a stupid motherfucker to the extent to which he doesn't take counsel from his peers. He's a dumbass alpha. He won't be alpha for long. Because he's going to create too many enemies and nobody's going to end up fucking with him. You got to be of use to the people that you're around. You have to have true friendship. And you can't have true friendship when you're trying to dominate everybody. You're trying to, you know, use your martiality over your own partners. You're going to end up getting killed. And you're going to end up getting stabbed in your back, bro. <laughs> like Brutus killed Caesar, shit. You know, you can't, you can't walk around like strong going motherfuckers like Tyrone and shit. I'm going to fuck your wife or something. No, it's not going to work. You already know this, man. If you the toughest guy in the room, and you carry yourself around like you the toughest, roughest guy in the room, somebody going to test you. Somebody going to see if you as tough as you acting like. That's the problem with this alpha shit. It's one, because if you're really alpha, so to speak, if you're really like a, a valuable guy, you're going to understand that you need friendship. You're a social animal. And that control and powering over other people it's not, you know, uh, the context in which, you, you know, you're going to actually uh, be appreciated or acknowledged or recognized by other persons. You, you know, if, you, if you're trying to be that guy, you're going to end up getting fucked up. I done seen it a million times. It doesn't even happen to me while I'm trying to be tough. Okay, you're a tough guy. Okay. Next thing you know, you got three motherfuckers on you. Damn. Okay. I learned a lesson as an adolescent. Just real talk. But see, a lot of men won't admit this because they worried about their image and being alpha and all this bullshit. You learn from your mistakes and hopefully you can teach other men or other, you know, human beings in general from your mistakes. But what I tend to, you know, I tend to find out, man, is that if you put out negative energy, that shit comes back to you. 
and I, I sometimes I have negative energy. I ain't gonna lie. It, it, it's just sometimes I do that. Sometimes I'm on some bullshit, and bullshit comes back to you when you're on bullshit. But sometimes you gotta be on some bullshit. But not all the time. If you're aggressive all the time, you're gonna end up getting fucked up. <laughs> Trust me. Keep keep being an asshole to everybody around you. And see how quickly your ass get taken out the game. And, and, and also, just to let you know, I was, look, I have lived among killers, which is fucked up, but I have. And those guys, they're not the loudest guys. Those are not the guys that are, you know, the guys yelling all the time. <laughs> Those guys are quiet as hell, man. Those guys don't say much. Those guys, they'll laugh or some shit like that. Especially if you insult them, they'll laugh at the shit. And then 30 minutes to an hour later, you ain't breathing the same. <laughs> it's fucked up, but that's just the reality. I've seen it happen. Like, damn. Bomb B, you know, we had this little dude, we used to call him Bomb B. Bomb B was like the quietest guy out of the bunch. Quietest one. Didn't say much. Shy. Little did we know Bomb B was a killer. He's in the penitentiary. He'll never get out. Surprised they ain't give him a death sentence. You play stupid games, you, you know, you, you win, you know, you win stupid prizes. But anyway, man, uh, I'm out of here, man. Um, you know, all that loud shit. Now, I'm loud, but, you know, uh, I'm doing it for entertainment value. For the most part, man, if you're around me, man, I'm just chilling, dog. I'm laughing. I'm I'm cracking jokes and I'm laughing. That's what I'm normally like. Talking shit. Yeah, I talk shit, but it's just shit talking. I'm usually cracking jokes and and and, and having fun. That's it. So anyway, y'all, man, thank you for your contributions. I want to thank uh, Rasheed Barnes. I want to thank Abo. Uh, I want to thank Man Friday, and uh, I want to thank Dig the. Uh, excuse me, Dig Thug, who says, I've read Martin Heidegger and he states that a hammer can't be a hammer without the nails and you using it. Why do they think that they can define themselves outside of what was attacked, uh, excuse me, attached to them? True indeed. Yeah, I mean, look, I like Heidegger, man. I ain't gonna lie. I like Heidegger. Um, and then that sentiment, I mean, that sentence makes sense. Sherry Thomas, thank you for your contribution. Barry Little, thank you for your contribution. Mr. Heat, thank you for yours. And uh, I'm about to sign out now, man. I'm going to hit you up with something tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to hit you with, but I'm going to be back in tomorrow. And it's going to be more mundane. I can't do this all the time. That's a little terse tonight. Uh, but it's stuff you need to know, man. got to know this stuff, especially if you're going to get hit with it. And you're going to be hit with it. All right? So at any rate, man, I'll holler at y'all later, man. Until the next time, one.